Well, today we, ha uh, we have with us Tracy Bauer. She's the manager of public affairs and institutional visits. Um, her responsibilities include overseeing the NNSS website, social media, media relations, and the tour program. And her uh, topic today is National Nuclear Security Administration's current activities. So I would like to welcome Tracy to come up. Well, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today. I have been with the um, NNSS for about the last year, and it has certainly been a busy year. There are a lot of uh, great programs that are underway, and I'd like to talk a little bit about today, uh, about the current mission at the NNSS, and talk a little bit about our role in national security. We'll have some time for questions, but if there's something that interests you along the way that you want to know a little bit more about, please don't hesitate to let me know. and. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions. So as you know, the NNSS is uh, a function of the uh, Department of Energy. Um, the Department of Energy has overarching responsibility for the NNSS. Within the DOE is the National Nuclear Security Administration. And the NNSA is responsible for eight sites across the country, and the NNSS is one of them. We report to the Nevada Field Office uh, here in Southern Nevada. And about every decade or so, the uh, federal government actually issues an RFP for a private company to come in and manage and operate the NNSS. And right now, the current operator at the NNSS is National Security Technologies. We've had the contract for about the last 11 years. There's a procurement underway right now. Um, they do go out for bid uh, for that project. But National Security Technologies has had the contract for about the last 11 years, and we're a joint venture between Northrop Grumman, uh, CH2M Hill, and Babcock and Wilcox. So the NNSS is one of the sites that National Security Technologies runs on behalf of the NNSA. Uh, we have the offices um, in North Las Vegas, where the Nevada field office is located. We, of course, have the NNSS located about 65 miles outside of Las Vegas. But we also have uh, uh, shops that are located across the country. We have an office in Livermore, California, at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. We have a special technologies laboratory in the Santa Barbara area. Uh, we have offices at New Mexico, at the Sandia National Laboratory, and Los Alamos National Laboratory. And then we have two remote sensing laboratories, one out at Nellis Air Force Base, and a second at Joint Base Andrews in the Washington, D.C. area. And I'll talk a little bit more about how the remote sensing lab fits into our national uh, security responsibilities. Our budget is about $646 million, and the majority of that money comes from outside of Southern Nevada, but is spent within the state of Nevada. So we are actually a big economic driver uh, here in Southern Nevada. The bulk of that budget, about $560 million, is for the m and contractor with National Security Technologies, but there are other contractors that work at the site as well. Uh, Navarro handles environmental management at the NNSS, and Terra Nevada handles security. Uh, the Nevada Field Office gets about $17 million in federal funding for their operations, and then there are some other smaller contractors as well. We have about 3,000 employees that work at the NNSS. About 2,100 of those are uh, National Security Technologies employees. Um, there are a number of federal employees and then again other contractors as well. We pay about $300 million in salaries and benefits and we employ a number of high-tech employees. So physicists, uh, biologists, uh, scientists, uh, mathematicians, um, engineers. And so we are the largest high-tech employer in Southern Nevada. Um, we spend about $30 million a year in procurement here in Southern Nevada. We've paid about $6.3 million a year in taxes and fees to state, uh, county, and municipal governments. That helps uh, those local governments to provide services that uh, we drive on roads just like everyone else, so we're happy to be a part of maintaining those. Um, and we have generated about $10 million to Nevada counties to support emergency response capabilities. And in total, our infrastructure is uh, valued at about $3.5 billion. So again, we're a large economic driver here in Southern Nevada. We'll periodically do an economic impact analysis to see how that impact is changing over time, and we're preparing to do another economic impact analysis right now. So our mission today, we have three primary missions. Uh, environmental management, I know you're all very familiar with, so I'm not going to get into a lot of that today. 
But I do want to talk a little bit about our defense experimentation and stockpile stewardship mission and our global security mission. So we work in partnership with the national laboratories, so Sandia National Lab, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. And we really provide a lo premier location for the national labs to conduct work that they could not do anywhere else in the country. Um, we're remote, uh, we're secure, um, and we have very, very little uh, chance of encroachment. So again, we're sort of the ideal place today, just as we were in 1951, when the NNSS was selected as the nation's testing ground for nuclear weapons. So the same benefits still hold true today and enable us to do work for the national laboratories as well as other federal agencies that they simply could not do anywhere else. Our primary responsibility under defense experimentation and stockpile stewardship is to ensure the safety, the security, and the effectiveness of the nation's nuclear weapons system. And again, the remote nature of the site allows us to do that. While nuclear weapons testing ceased in 1992, we still have the responsibility for maintaining the safety, the security, and the effectiveness of the nuclear weapons that exist in the nation's stockpile. We do that by conducting subcritical experiments at the NNSS that tell us how those nuclear weapons are aging, tell us that they would still operate in the same way if, heaven forbid, they were ever needed again. Uh, so we do that in a way that allows scientists to tell how that plutonium and other special nuclear material is aging, but we do that without achieving criticality. Um, and that is based on the treaties that have existed for the last 25 years that prevent us from doing full-scale nuclear tests. Scientists have the ability to do that in this area right here called the glove box so that allows them to, uh, to test that special nuclear material. Um, they do this also in uh, an area called U1A, which is located 1,000 feet underground. And then they also do that at our Joint Actinide Shock Physics Research Experimental Facility, or JASPER for short. And I'd like to show you a video that will do a much better job of explaining what JASPER does than I can do. Welcome to JASPER, the Joint Actinide Shock Physics Experimental Research Facility operated by a team under the leadership of the Nevada National Security Site and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory for the National Nuclear Security Administration. JASPER is an experimental facility at the Nevada National Security Site devoted to shock physics studies of plutonium at high pressures. Located 80 miles northwest of Las Vegas, Nevada, JASPER resides in the south central region of the Nevada National Security Site. The heart of JASPER is the two-stage gas gun, measuring 65 feet long. JASPER consists of several components. The breech is the first stage of the gas gun. Gunpowder is placed inside to drive the overall experiment. The pump tube is filled with a light gas, typically hydrogen, and is the main driving force for firing the projectile down the launch tube. The launch tube guides the high-velocity projectile to the actinide target. The nested confinement systems are at the end of the gun, where the experiment is located. The primary target chamber and the secondary confinement chamber assure that no target materials escape following an experiment. A JASPER experiment takes less than a second to execute. The SCC pressure is below 79 millitor. Three, two, one, fire. <laughs> The data collected within that short time allows researchers to create more accurate models that can predict aging effects, overall performance, and the safety of stockpiled nuclear weapons. The following animation of a JASPER experiment shows how the two-stage gas gun creates unique physical conditions important to the nation's stockpile stewardship program. A 10-pound piston is inserted into the gun's breech to be followed by a gunpowder assembly filled with standard military propellant. This assembly will provide the driving force to push the piston down the pump tube. After the breech plug is installed, the breech is sealed. From the control room, a firing pulse is sent to the breech gun. This pulse starts a series of events that ignite the propellant. The pressure within the breach reaches more than 500 atmospheres. As the piston accelerates down the pump tube, the hydrogen gas is compressed and heated, creating the driving force for the second stage of the gas gun. At the end of the pump tube, 
the piston reaches the end of the acceleration reservoir, which gradually reduces in diameter, thus increasing the gas pressure. When the compressed gas reaches a pressure of 10,000 pounds per square inch, a rupture valve breaks and propels a 15-gram projectile down the launch tube. The pressure in the acceleration reservoir continues to rise to well over 100,000 psi. The piston extrudes into the acceleration reservoir, creating a seal. At the end of the launch tube, the projectile enters the secondary confinement chamber, from which all air has been evacuated. This chamber is eight feet in diameter and serves as a secondary barrier against any release of material to the environment. At this point, the projectile is traveling up to eight kilometers per second, or 18,000 miles per hour. For comparison, this speed is approximately 10 times faster than a bullet from a standard hunting rifle. As the projectile travels through a free flight zone, a continuous wave X-ray system detects the projectile. This system serves as the primary trigger for both the diagnostic and confinement systems. The two flash X-rays photograph the projectile in flight. Both the time between the flashes and distance traveled by the projectile are measured to an accuracy of more than 99.9%. This information allows the experimenter to precisely determine the projectile velocity. The projectile then passes through the ultra-fast closure valve system. This system closes within 80 microseconds to prevent material from escaping. Receiving a signal from the continuous wave X-ray system, 12 detonators ignite a layer of high explosives surrounding a soft aluminum tube. The explosives symmetrically crush the tube, creating a seal and isolating the target material. When the projectile hits the target, the impact produces a high pressure shock wave millions of times the atmospheric pressure at Earth's surface. Let's take a closer look at what happens as the projectile hits the plutonium target. At impact, ejecta from the target are propelled backward at nearly the same speed as the projectile. The ultra-fast closure valve system is designed to close just behind the projectile to prevent any plutonium from escaping. In some experiments, the target resembles a top hat. This design allows researchers to determine when the shock wave reaches the front and back surfaces of the plutonium sample. Electrical pins measure the shock velocity precisely. Data to support the stockpile stewardship program are collected within a fraction of a microsecond. The arrow shows the difference in shock arrival times between the front and back surfaces. These data are used to determine the equation of state of plutonium. Following an experiment, everything in the primary target chamber is turned into rubble. This chamber is removed from the secondary confinement chamber and disposed of as waste. The JASPER facility can now be prepared for the next experiment. That's one of the ways that scientists can still conduct uh, experiments uh, ensuring that the nation's nuclear weapons are safe, secure, and effective, but without uh, creating uh, criticality without actually exploding a weapon. Um, so it's a much safer way, and it is uh, within the bounds of the treaties that exist um, over the last 25 years that prevent us from doing full-scale nuclear tests. So that's one of the key missions at the NNSS. The second is global security. And it's probably one that uh, people don't know as much about at the NNSS. Over the last uh, uh, several decades, we've really expanded the role that we play in uh, global security through our remote sensing laboratories. Again, I mentioned we have a team out at Nellis Air Force Base and another team at Joint Base Andrews um, in the Washington, D.C. area. And these are crews that are experts at detecting and measuring radiation. Um, they deploy at a moment's notice, if needed, in an emergency to respond to a site. But they will also go out and proactively uh, measure radiation levels for major events. So prior to a presidential inauguration, prior to the Super Bowl, or other uh, political conventions um, across the country, the teams at the remote sensing lab go in and do some background radiation detection ahead of time to determine what's normal in a community. And then law enforcement can use that information to help uh, if they suspect that something is uh, being brought into a community that perhaps shouldn't be there. Um, so the teams have uh, state-of-the-art sensors that allow them to go in and, and measure that radiation. 
And then again, if there is something that happens, say for example, at, uh, when Japan had the Fukushima uh, power plant disaster, teams from RSL actually went over to help the Japanese to map the radiation levels in that area. Um, they are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have to be able to respond to an emergency within a couple of hours. Um, and having teams on both sides of the country allows them to do that. Um, so again, they go out and proactively uh, work events, uh, such as uh, the Super Bowl, um, and then they'll also respond if needed uh, to an emergency. So that's one of the ways that they're helping uh, to keep communities secure. That work is important, and it is work that our team does very, very well, but there may be situations where it may not necessarily be safe to actually send people in to measure radiation levels. So for example, uh, during the Fukushima uh, power plant disaster. Um, so our teams are actually working to expand the use of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that they can attach those sensors to and use those unmanned vehicles to go in and measure radiation in places where it may not be safe for people to go. Um, certainly, um, we can use those, those sensors and those unmanned vehicles in addition to um, our team and our helicopters. Um, so they're working to expand the use of uh, unmanned aerial systems. Over the last couple of years, we went from having a fleet of two to now more than a dozen. And we're working on some cooperative research and development agreements that will expand the use of those unmanned vehicles. After the Oklahoma City bombing in the late 1990s, uh, we actually established a training uh, ground out at the NNSS for first responders. And we provide uh, training for police officers, for firefighters and paramedics across the country at no charge to those agencies to teach first responders how to detect radiation. If you're a police officer in a community, you may never have had the training on how to detect radiation. Um, but a lot of uh, agencies across the country actually have radiation detection equipment. So we provide training out at the NNSS where we bring them out to uh, the site of a former nuclear test. So there's still a little bit of background radiation there, but it's safe for them to be there. It's just slightly elevated, so it's just enough that they can use some equipment to learn how to detect radiation using equipment in a real life scenario. We've trained about 200,000 first responders from across the country, and we'll also take the training to them. So if you're a large police or fire agency, say in New York or Houston, we'll actually bring the training to you, or uh, we have first responders that come out to Southern Nevada for this training. Uh, we do this year round. I'd like to show you a little bit about uh, one of the training classes that we did for the Las Vegas Fire and Rescue right here in Southern Nevada. So through that training, first responders come out, and the very first thing they learn how to do is to suit up to protect themselves. Um, they learn how to operate radiation detection equipment. If you go out to the site, it looks a little bit like an abandoned uh, or a bombed out town. There's kind of a main street set up with a computer shop, a, a clothing store, I think. There's a, an accounting office. Um, there are some overturned vehicles. There's an overturned uh, rail car. There is even a uh, large, I think it's a 747 that's in three pieces scattered across the debris field. And first responders will take their uh, radiation detection equi equipment out. There are sources that are uh, protected but that are placed throughout the site. 
And they then use this equipment and learn how to actually go out and detect those radiation sources and figure out, one, how safe is it for them? How close can they get to figure out where that is? Two, how can they help victims that may have been uh, contaminated with radiation? Um, and then what to do from there? Uh, and so our team spend about a week with these first responders from around the country teaching them how to do that. And when you talk to them at the beginning of the class, many of them have shared that radiation is something that scared them, and rightfully so. But when you talk to them at the end of that class, they had a much higher comfort level about how they could respond in their communities to keep them safe. So it's a great program that we're proud to offer. Again, we've trained about 200,000 first responders at, at no cost to them. Uh, we get some federal funding in order to do this type of training. Um, and it's a great resource for communities that may not otherwise have the opportunity to learn um, how to respond. And it's certainly something that more and more communities need to be aware of how to respond um, if needed. Uh, one of the other aspects of global security is conducting source physics experiments. So we want to be able um, to scientifically say if there is uh, a, some geological movement, say, across the world, whether or not that was something that was an earthquake or whether or not that was some sort of underground explosion that shouldn't be happening. So our scientists are conducting source physics experiments that help them to detect whether or not nuclear testing is occurring elsewhere in the world. Um, again, that's part of the treaty verification and that's work that, again, can't be conducted necessarily anywhere else but at the NNSS. So through the course of the scientific work that we do at the NNSS, um, we develop a lot of expertise that is great for the work that we do, but we think that we have a responsibility to help uh, transfer some of that into the private sector and partner with the private sector wherever we can. So we create partnerships through cooperative research and development agreements. And the photo that you see there is the first uh, cooperative research and development agreement that we conducted with a, com a local company here called GMIS. Uh, they're based out in Henderson, um, and GMIS is looking at ways that they can use um, medical isotopes, which are used in a variety of medical tests um, that have low radioactivity, but they also have a very short half-life. Um, that makes it difficult for hospitals and medical imaging centers to stock them. Um, so we've signed a, an agreement with GMIS that will look at ways that they can simply manufacture those medical isotopes on site so that they don't have to transport them in from other places that would allow them to be used for a longer period of time um, because they wouldn't lose so much time in transport. So we're working with GMIS on the creation of that using some of the expertise um, that exists at the NNSS. And then we have signed a second cooperative research and development agreement with Praxis Aerospace, another local company. Praxis is a, a, a company that is in unmanned aerial systems. So we're looking at taking their expertise in unmanned aerial vehicles our expertise on those radiological sensors and figuring out how we can partner to make those UAVs more effective for the work that we do uh, for the remote sensing laboratory. I'm gonna play one more video for you and talk a little bit more about that research and development agreement. The Nevada National Security Site soars to new heights after a cooperative research and development agreement brings its unmanned aerial system program into an exciting new era. We have the responsibility to go in if there was ever a radiological or nuclear accident, emergency, whatever it might be. Being able to use an unmanned system to do that is both more efficient and allows us the ability to get into areas that would be very difficult with larger manned systems. Praxis came to us as a federal government to say, hey, we have some things that we would like to advance that we can use the federal government for. It was the perfect marriage for us. It allowed us to move a little bit further and faster into the UAS arena because they bring a vast amount of industry knowledge that we currently don't have in the UAS. We have a lot of expertise in nuclear items. We don't have a lot of expertise in some other things. And so to bring that expertise in from um, the corporate world is a great thing. One of the fantastic opportunities we have here is you've got such a, a great training area with the live hazards that are available, the spectrum that's available, just the size of it alone. I mean, it's bigger than Rhode Island. It's an amazing capability for us to be able to have access to. So we have a facility out there that's unlike any others with the restricted airspace, the ability to release different chemicals, to release radioactive material, where we can use these sensors that are, will go on these aircraft to determine how 
dangerous that particular area is. That you're not going to find anywhere else in the United States. There are high hopes that this agreement will benefit the first responder training programs that are held at the NNSS. And we've been doing training for the first response community for the past 15 years. Probably trained close to 200,000 first responders. And that is just one more tool in their tool chest to help save lives. I think it's going to be a tremendous resource for the first response community. So the nice thing about those two cooperative research and development agreements is that those are both with local companies. So we are um, hopeful that that will also help to generate additional economic benefits here in Southern Nevada, create additional jobs here in Southern Nevada as well. Um, we're certainly open to uh, cooperative research and development agreements outside of Southern Nevada, but it's terrific that uh, the two uh, that we've signed so far um, are based here in Southern Nevada. So we are also pretty active in the community. Uh, we do a lot to try to expand uh, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, we've provided more than a million dollars in scholarships uh, to UNLV, to local high school students, um, as well as to students in uh, Livermore and uh, Santa Barbara, California, as well as in Los Alamos. Um, so we're pretty active in the community. We sponsor the FIRST Robotics uh, program, which um, helps students to uh, create robots and, and encourage um, interest in science and, and engineering and math. Um, we are um, also active in the volunteer community. Our staff volunteers at uh, Three Square and a number of different uh, organizations uh, throughout Southern Nevada. We partner with the Clark County School District um, at some at-risk schools as well as at some uh, uh, magnet schools uh, that include uh, Jim Bridger Middle School, which is a, a STEM technology or a STEAM technology, science, technology, engineering, art, and math um, at Jim Bridger. Um, we're also active on social media, so you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, as you can see, too, we have a number of videos that uh, we make available on YouTube. And then last year, we launched a new website, nnss.gov, and we uh, publish articles uh, pretty regularly on nnss.gov about the current mission, about those cooperative research and development agreements as well. So if you'd like to stay in touch with us uh, that way, you can certainly do that as well. We also have uh, a public tour program um, that is pretty popular here in Southern Nevada. Um, we offer a monthly public tour at the NNSS, and they are full through 2017, but we're getting ready in the next week or so to launch the dates for 2018. And we expect that those will fill up pretty quickly as well. So if you have uh, friends or family who have not had a chance to go out and take a look at the site, you can see some of the historic sites um, from the nuclear weapons testing days, but then you can also get a glimpse of some of the sites that we've talked a little bit about today and the current mission. So it's a great opportunity to kind of see firsthand the history at the site and the current mission at the site. Um, it's a great tour, uh, certainly a little warm this time of year, but uh, a great tour nonetheless. So again, those dates will be launched in the next week or so. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Are the training sessions open to the public? They are not. They're not. No, they are specific to first responders. Um, and again, we get some federal funding to do that. Um, so we will make contact with the agencies and then they assign their staff to do that. Um, the great thing about that though too is it, it again, provides them with real life training in a place that they probably would never be able to see otherwise and that they wouldn't be able to get that firsthand experience. So we do have to limit it. There's a lot of nuclear weapons. How does, how are they testing all of those, each one of those weapons or are they just? They're learning more about how the material in those weapons ages. So they look at how does plutonium react as it ages? How does it react under varying changes, you know, various pressures? So the, the general goal, though, is to figure out as, new, as these weapons age, how would they react if needed? Um, does age play a difference in it? Does various, pressure, do various pressures play, make a difference in how they would react as well? 1970s and 80s and perhaps beyond, they had uh, nuclear weapons accident exercises out at the test site, and I wondered if they are periodically continuing to have such exercises. I can tell you that we have a very robust safeguard and security program, and that includes emergency preparedness. In fact, we just had an exercise about two weeks ago. Uh, they prepare for a variety of scenarios to ensure that our employees are prepared to respond uh, if needed. And we partner with other agencies to do that as well. We work cooperatively with uh, Clark County, with our partners in North Las Vegas, 
Um, so there are a number of agencies that participate in those emergency exercises to make sure that whether it is specific to the work that we do at the site or some other you know, act, an earthquake or anything else that might, that might occur, that we would be prepared to respond accordingly. Um, so the exercise that occurred a couple of weeks ago, I think we had about 700 uh, people participate in that exercise. Um, everything from, we have two fire stations that are located at the NNSS, so our fire and rescue um, uh, team participated, our public information staff participated in terms of how would we communicate with the public about what was happening. So at all levels of the organization, we do those emergency preparedness exercises regularly to be prepared to respond. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to present today. And if you have any questions, um, Barb can give you my contact information. And I've got some business cards with me as well. I'd be happy to hand those out. So thank you. Okay.